the first stage of humiliation for Jesus was conception and birth. In being born as a human, Jesus left the glory and perfection of heaven. He left perfect communion with the Father to be here with us. In order to do the work necessary for our salvation, Jesus had to come into the world just as we come into it. This was not a heavenly body which merely came to earth through Mary, nor was it a separate creation. The sinless one had to assume an earthly, corruptible, weakened, vulnerable, suffering human nature. He was bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh. Therefore, he had to be born of woman, as symbolized by the manger on the screen. Hear the word of the Lord from Philippians 2, 5 through 8. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ, who being very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Let us confess this truth together using the words of the Belgic Confession. Please join me on the screen saying together, we confess that God fulfilled the promise which he had made to the early fathers by the mouth of his holy prophets, which he sent by the only eternal Son into the world at the time set by him. The Son took the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man, to the assuming a real human nature with all its weaknesses except for sin, being conceived in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit without. The second stage of humiliation for Jesus was his life as a human being, as symbolized by the net and the fishes on the screen. Jesus is fully God and fully man. One of the great mysteries of the Christian faith, but essential and true. We know he was fully human because when he was tired, he slept. When he was hungry, he ate. When he had to work, he went to work. And when he felt pain, he suffered. His suffering was prophesied long ago in the 700s BC through the prophet Isaiah. At first, the book of Isaiah appears long, intimidating, and confusing. But the book of 66 chapters has an intentional structure that communicates the power and mercy of Yahweh. One of the major themes through Isaiah is the role of the servant. The word servant, abed in Hebrew, sometimes refers to the Israelites, sometimes refers to the king's servants, sometimes it refers to the Assyrians, but in Isaiah 53, the servant refers to the coming Messiah. The important and well-known passage is quoted or referenced 21 times in the New Testament. Isaiah 53 is so valuable because it teaches us the true doctrine of substitutionary atonement, that Jesus subbed himself in our place to forgive us our sins and to save us from the justified wrath of God by dying on the cross. God Almighty was not forced to do this because of some higher moral standard. He was not bound by some divine legality. God chose to have his son die for us and to reveal his love in the most powerful way. 
No other event in his human history could communicate God's grace better than the sacrifice of his own son. Isaiah 53 says, He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has, has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. The Apostles' Creed says that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. Please join me on this screen as we read together Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer 37. So I'll read the question, and you can join me in the answer. What do you understand by the word suffered? That during his whole life on earth, but especially at the end, Christ sustained in body and soul the anger of God against the sin of the whole human race. This he did in order that by his suffering and the only atoning sacrifice, he might set free body and soul from eternal condemnation, and gain for us God's grace, righteousness, and eternal life. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, our Messiah, without you, we would be pierced for our transgressions. Without you, we would be crushed under our own sins. Without you, we would have no peace. Without you, we would turn our own way. Without you, we would be eternally punished. But with you, we have peace. With you, we are healed. With you, we confess our sins and we are forgiven. With you, we are reconciled with our Creator. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Please stand and sing. The third stage of humiliation for Jesus was his crucifixion. And of course, the crucifixion is what we typically think of when we think of the sufferings of Jesus. And one of the things we like to focus on about the crucifixion is the actual physical suffering that Jesus endured for you and for me. When we think about the crucifixion, we almost only think of what Jesus endured in a physical way. But in Galatians 3, we learn that there was more to Jesus' suffering on the cross than the physical suffering that Jesus endured. Hear the word of the Lord from Galatians 3, verses 10 through 14, where Paul says, For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, says Paul, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith, says Paul. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. People of God, we remember the suffering of Jesus on the cross, the curse of Jesus on the cross through the sacrament 
of communion this evening. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it and he said to his disciples, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after the supper and he said, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Therefore, people of God, we proclaim our faith as signed and sealed in this sacrament by saying together, Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Join me in prayer. God, as we remember and dwell on what Christ has done for us, as we physically consume the suffering of our Savior, we ask, may we remember well. Father, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this this cup may be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Gather your whole church, O Lord, into the glory of your kingdom. And we pray in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The fourth stage of humiliation for Jesus was his burial as symbolized by the tomb. Burial is the seal of death. Christ was placed in a grave for us as confirmation of the curse and finality of death. Hear the word of the Lord from John 19, verse 31 through 42. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the body, the broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus, and found that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was the disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. The fifth and final stage of humiliation is called descent into hell. 
Hear the word of the Lord from Psalm 22, 1 through 8. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, and I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you, they cried out, and they were saved. In you, they trusted, and were not put to shame. But I am a worm, and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me, mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When the Apostles' Creed says that Jesus descended into hell, what does it mean? These are some of the most recited words in all of human history, the Apostles' Creed. So these words have been said a lot. But what do they mean? Whenever I take a kids through a profession of faith class, I always walk through the Apostles' Creed with them. And I always tell them when we read through the Apostles' Creed, I want you to think of one question, at least one question, that, you know, something about the Creed that confuses you, or you want to talk about something, something you're not sure about, You've got to come up with at least one question when we're done reading the creed. And one of the most asked questions in my experience in teaching profession of faith class is kids asking, wanting to know, what does it mean that Jesus descended into hell? And I always say, great question. What would you say if I told you that that phrase, that Jesus descended into hell, that that phrase does not appear anywhere in the Bible? And the kids always looked at me with shocked faces. This phrase, that Jesus descended into hell, is not anywhere in Scripture. Nowhere in Scripture do we hear anything about where Jesus went after he died except a tomb. Not to mention that while Jesus is on the cross, he says to the criminal next to him, today you will be with me in paradise. If these words are not in Scripture, if they are not in the Bible, then why are they there in the creed? And more importantly, what do these words mean? Part of the problem that we have in our culture today in terms of answering that question and wrestling with this question is we, we all here today have ideas and misconceptions about what hell is. We, in our culture, we tend to think of hell as a location, as a destination, perhaps even as a physical, geographical destination, a place of fire and burning and devils and darkness. This concept of hell was not shared by the people who wrote this creed somewhere in the 300s AD. So if we are going to understand what these words, these very well-known words mean, then, then we've got to think about what hell really is. Hell can mean so many different things, and it means so many different things to different people. The Bible even uses different words for hell. It uses Sheol, and it uses Hades, and it uses Gehenna, and all three of those words mean different things. And to make matters even more confusing, the Apostles' Creed uses another different word. It uses the Latin word, inferna. So again, what does it mean that Jesus went there? Did Jesus literally go to some geographical destination? Well, it just so happens that another uh, confession or another summary of what we believe called the Heidelberg Catechism talks about this very thing. The Heidelberg Catechism, for those of you who don't know, goes through the Apostles' Creed line by line and explains every single line that occurs. 
And question 44 of the Heidelberg Catechism asks, why does the creed, the Apostles' Creed, add that he descended into hell? And the answer is this, and I'll ask you to recite it later, not now. The answer is this, to assure me in times of personal crisis and temptation that Christ my Lord, by suffering unspeakable anguish, pain, and terror of soul, and I want you to pay attention to this part of it, especially on the cross, but also earlier, has delivered me from the anguish and torment of hell. Hopefully you notice it, but the Catechism speaks about hell for Jesus, not only on the cross, but also earlier. And the Catechism says that this hell that Jesus experiences was on the cross, but also earlier in his life. And so we're not talking, I want to be clear, we're not talking about a geographic destination. We're not talking about a location. And so once again, I want us to see and recognize that typically when you and I, when we in our culture, when we think of hell, we tend to think strictly of a place where condemned dead people go, a a location, a destination. But the catechism seems to say that Christ didn't literally go to what we think of as hell. It notes that being on the cross and experiences in his life were some kind of of hellish reality. Well, what happened to Jesus on the cross that what he experiences could be described as being in hell? On the cross and earlier, what did Jesus experience? The writers of the Apostles' Creed and the Heidelberg Catechism understand something that perhaps we in our culture do not. That hell is not necessarily a destination, is not necessarily a location. That hell is a spiritual state of being. And Jesus was in it. In his life, before he was even on the cross, Jesus was abandoned by the people closest to him. He was betrayed by Judas for money, rejected by his best friend, Peter. And incidentally, we don't see any of the disciples in jail along with Jesus because they all abandoned him. Despite the fact that Jesus offered them hope and peace, despite all the miracles that they saw him do, despite all the intimate teachings that he shared with them, they abandoned their friendship with Jesus, despite all they had been through with him. The Catechism also says that especially on the cross, so here we are in a geographic destination on the cross, but on the cross, Jesus descended into hell. And this is where Psalm 22 helps us. So we've got to try to put ourselves in those moments on the cross in order to understand what the creed is trying to say to us. And remember that hell is not only a destination, it is a spiritual state of being. And here Jesus was on the cross, the Son of God, having had perfect communion with the Father. Jesus, because of his perfection and because he, had, he didn't have sin to plug up his ears, Jesus heard the Father's will at all times and could constantly hear his Father's voice in a way. He was so in tune with the Father that he could speak for him. And this is what we see in the Gospels. Jesus speaking for the Father. He could forgive sins. He could speak powerful parables of grace and truth. He could wield the power of God against storms. Perfect communion with the Father. What is hell? Hell is a place devoid of God and all of his goodness. When people say that a place here on earth is a hell on earth, what they are saying is that there is a place that is so bad that it feels like there is nothing good about it, that there is no goodness of any kind there. So not only is Jesus abandoned by his friends, Jesus 
is also abandoned by his father and all of the goodness that comes with him. Matthew 27, verse 45 and 46 says this, From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, quoting Psalm 22, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why? Why have you forsaken me? On the cross, we have Jesus saying, someone who's enjoyed perfect communion with the Father, we have Jesus saying, my God, my God, where are you? Father, where did you go? Jesus had perfect communion with the Father, and on the cross, he couldn't find his Father anymore. He couldn't hear his Father's voice. He didn't know anymore the Father's will. He couldn't experience any of his goodness. He couldn't cling to any of that hope. He no longer had any communion with the Father that he had enjoyed. Jesus himself had said in the Gospel of Luke that the Father always answers his children when they ask for something. And on the cross, Jesus gets no answer. When Jesus cries out to the Father, he gets nothing back. Jesus goes from perfect communion to complete rejection. Matthew tells us that darkness covers the land, and it makes me wonder if God physically abandoned that entire physical area. We tend to focus on the physical pain once again. We talked about that earlier. We, in our culture, we tend to focus on the physical pain that Jesus endured, the crown of thorns and the the nails in Jesus' feet and hands. We wince when we think about Jesus being whipped and being pierced with the spear and all that physical pain that he experienced. But the physical pain is only the beginning of what Jesus experienced. On the cross, Jesus was an orphan, rejected by his friends and family and rejected by his heavenly Father. The lowest people in Jesus' culture were people with no family and friends, and on the cross, Jesus was truly and utterly alone in such a way that you and I have never experienced No father, no friends, no family. This is the hell that the Apostles' Creed is talking about. Because hell is being separated from God. And on the cross, this is what Jesus experienced. Jesus asked something of the Father and he got no answer. Jesus sought the Father and he could not find him. Jesus on the cross experiences the sheer terror of a human being spiritually dying. Not just physically dying, spiritually dying, being completely and truly separated from God and all of the goodness that goes with him. This is hell. Complete rejection and complete separation. And as the Catechism notes, this is really, really important. Because what Jesus experienced, and what he experienced with that rejection and separation from the Father, that should have been our experience in eternity. Because of our sin, because of our brokenness, because of the brokenness of this world, God should have rejected us. We should have been separated from Him. We should have been the one that was abandoned. It should be you and I dying a spiritual death where we can't see or hear the Father anymore or experience any of the goodness that comes with Him. On this earth, we have the benefit of having God's Word We get to hear God's will. We have the body of Christ, the church, other human beings present with us. God's Holy Spirit leads us and guides us and directs us. We're part of a society that has justice and morality. We get to see the beauty and goodness of this creation, the beauty and the goodness of other image-bearing human beings. All of those things are small tastes 
of the goodness of God. In hell, all of those things are absent. All of that goodness of God is separated from us. And so imagine the terror of having nothing of the goodness of God anymore. Having no idea where God is, no clue of what God is saying, no people around to love you, no idea what God's will is, no assurance of his love, no hope of the future, no sense of peace, no beauty, no grace, no mercy. This is spiritual death and this is is what our Savior experienced on our behalf. In closing, I'd like to invite you to recite the words of the Catechism together. I'll read the question and I invite you to respond with me. People of God, why does the Apostles' Creed add he descended into hell? And let's say together, to assure me in times of personal crisis and temptation that Christ my Lord, by suffering unspeakable anguish, pain and terror of soul, especially on the cross, but also earlier, has delivered me from the anguish and torment of hell. Hallelujah, and thanks be to God. Join me in prayer. Father in heaven, we lament these realities about the sufferings of Jesus. We lament all these sufferings, birth, life, crucifixion, burial, and descent into hell. We lament all these things because we know, Lord, that Jesus experienced these things because of us. And yet, God, at the same time, we know that were it not for these sufferings, we could not enjoy you, experience you, delight in you, worship you, be with you, And so in our lament, Father, in our lament of the sufferings of Jesus, we offer you our humble gratitude, and we ask that you would hear our prayer and accept our praise. Amen.